Hey everyone, it's Ornlu, and it's time for the second part of State of the Civs 2024. So for those who have not seen the first segment, State of the Civs is a short series I do around the start of a new year, where we take a holistic look at all of the civilizations at AoE2 right now, assessing not just how balanced they are, but also how cohesive is their design. Basically, do these civs feel like a natural part of the AoE2 roster? Are they unique? Do they have situations where they shine and situations where they struggle? Do their bonuses feel gimmicky or out of place? That sort of thing. In an attempt to quantify these fairly nebulous concepts, as well as to keep track of all the different civs in the game, we're going to place everybody on a modified tier list. I explain what I mean by the different tiers in the first part, so be sure to check it out if you haven't seen it yet. Of course, this is episode 2, and since we're going in alphabetical order, today we will be assessing the Byzantines, Celts, Chinese, Cumans, Dravidians, Ethiopians, Franks, Georgians, and Goths. Lastly, if you guys are excited for this breakdown, be sure to leave a like on the video, comment on what you think of the civs we cover, and subscribe to the channel for tons more AoE2 content. With our introductory logistics complete, let's jump right back into the reviews. We get to kick things off with one of the old standbys of AoE2, the Byzantines. This Age of Kings defensive civilization has always been the archetype for weathering the storm of enemy attacks to grind them down with efficient armies. Their most famous bonuses are their extra building HP and cheaper counter units, and those certainly help you in going about that game plan. Furthermore, strong monks, free town watch and town patrol, and even cheap Imperial Age all help the Byzantines player not die as they go about their tech switches. Of course, despite missing some important offensive techs like Bloodlines, Blast Furnace, and Siege Engineers, Byzantines still have the single broadest tech tree of any Civ in AoE2, and still possess a deadly power unit in the Cataphract. Especially in tournament settings, these guys are known for being a hybrid and water map powerhouse carried by their faster attacking fire ships. That said, the Byzantine Navy brings us to the balance changes received by the Civ in 2023. With the introduction of the Drummond alongside the Roman Civ, Byzantines receive them as well, replacing the Cannon Galleon. On top of that, Byzantine Drummonds attack faster, although this basically just makes up for their lack of siege engineers, and can get some extra blast radius with the Greek fire technology. Bombard Tower as well got some flaming projectiles and a tiny amount of blast damage with that unique tech for a little bit of utility on land maps. Still, last year I placed Byzantines in the complete tier. They are very much a known quantity of an AoE2 civ, and that's not a bad thing. The broad tech tree and defensive approach certainly stands out amongst the AoE2 civs, and on top of that, Byzantines are viable in basically any map type. They still shine the most on hybrid maps, but the Byzantines are a classic case of a strong but fair civ. Personally, I don't really think they needed the Drummond at all, but that's probably just the old AOC coot in me. No reason to change their complete tier status for 2024. Another Age of Kings civilization enters the arena with the Celts. With the original three Western European civilizations specializing in a different archetype, Britons with archers, Franks with cavalry, that leaves the Celts to possess their strengths in infantry and siege. These guys are all about hitting you hard and fast, with faster working lumberjacks being one of the single most generically applicable eco bonuses in the game. Faster moving infantry gives Celts an excellent men at arms rush, and honestly, this save is one of the few that can really justify going for that unit throughout the feudal age. Once Castle Age rolls around, Celts can make use of their fantastic siege workshop, either to apply a ton of pressure in the form of an all-in a la Huang, or to just use that potential to get a strong economy behind it. No matter how you cut it, Celts need to make something happen by mid-Castle Age, as the mediocre knights and awful archers really encourage a switch into infantry and siege for the late game. This dynamic has always been the cornerstone of Celts. Strong early, weak in the late Castle Age slash early Imperial Age, and then strong once again in the post-Imperial Age. As of last year, Celts were still considered largely viable on many different map types, especially on closed maps and team games, and that's why I placed them in the almost there tier. Their big issue was their Castle Age unique tech Stronghold, which was just not all that useful. Thankfully, the devs did address this tech in 2023, with Strongholds now increasing tower and castle fire rate by 33% instead of 25%, and additionally providing an area of effect healing to all nearby infantry units. That is certainly a nice change, as well as the addition of Gambesons for a strong infantry civ, but I'd argue that the biggest buff to Celts was to their Woad Raider unique unit. Woad Raiders always had the unfortunate reputation of being awful in the mid-game, and only useful in post-imperial. Age. Well, both Castle and Imperial Age Woad Raiders got an increase to their HP and attack, and now the unit is downright nasty against pretty much everything except Heavy Cavalry and Siege. So why is it that with all of the positive developments, I will be downgrading Celts to something is off for 2024? Well, honestly, I wish I didn't have to, but Celts feel a little power crept right now. Lacking strong cavalry, archers, monks, and gunpowder really kill a civilization in the current meta, and the Celts fall prey to all of those units. The solid economy used to be enough to make them competitive on Arabia and Arena, but now there are just so many powerful civilizations on those map archetypes. I'm honestly not sure what the Civ needs, if anything. Perhaps this is a case where other Civs being toned down could bring the Celts back into the limelight. At the very least, I do think these guys are underrated by pro players that are unwilling to deviate from the meta of cavalry and monk play. As the year progressed and Celts were floundering, the devs did introduce ring archer armor as well to the Civ, which honestly did not do much other than kill the little bit of flavor the Civ had in being the only Civ to possess no more than two Imperial Age blacksmith techs. I can't say I'm super happy with where 
Celts are right now, but I'm not sure what, if anything, needs to be done with these guys. Moving on now to our third classic Civ in a row, we have the Chinese. Although classified as an archer civilization by the game, Chinese have always struck me as more of an economy civilization, with their four eco bonuses kind of pointing you in that direction. Most famous of these is going to be their start. You get double the starting villagers compared to most civs, but at the cost of a quarter of your starting wood and all of your starting food. This does admittedly make the civ quite difficult to play for casual players, but I'm of the belief that with some practice, they're not that hard to figure out in the early game. The extra town center population space and line of sight help a lot there in smoothing out an otherwise rocky start. Beyond that, cheaper technologies and longer lasting farms give the civ a ton of strength and flexibility in the mid game, which when combined with an open tech tree provides us with a civ that has a ton of potential on anything resembling an open map. Knights, camels, and archers all are common options with the Chinese in the mid game, whereas their imperial age tends to be dominated by their powerful Chuko new unique unit, supported by trash, siege rams, and potentially even bombard towers. Still, Chinese possess some very noticeable weaknesses, especially due to a start that can be easily thrown off by aggression or laming, as well as possessing mediocre swordsmen and monks. Strong siege has always been the Achilles heel with this civ, and that remains true to this day. Speaking of which, last year I placed Chinese in the complete tier. They were strong, but not quite overpowered on most land maps, but could still struggle in closed or nomad maps. Naturally, the devs decided to hit Chinese with a pretty massive nerf, reducing their technology discount by 5% per age. Later on, to compensate for this, they gave their town centers even more population space and line of sight, a change that was especially targeted at more casual players. As you might be able to tell, I'm not the biggest fan of these changes, as I thought Chinese were fine. Nevertheless, these guys remain a viable option on several different map types at a high level, so I cannot complain too much, and they will remain in the complete tier for 2024. In addition to open maps, Chinese are always going to be a great choice on regicide settings due to the extra starting resources in that game mode, and they're a reasonable choice in many team game settings as well. Chukwunu were a fun unit that fill a pretty different role from traditional archers, and the variety of viable army compositions give the Civ a fighting chance in most matchups. Even if I grumble, I have to admit that Chinese are still a very well-rounded civilization. Well, we were doing pretty nicely so far, but now we turn to the Cumans. This last con's cavalry civilization serves as the bridge between the Asian steppe civs like Mongols and Tatars, with the Eurasian civs like Slavs and Magyars. A nomad civ at heart, Cumans are all about sprawling out with a powerful economy and hordes of quick units. Of course, their most famous bonus is their ability to build a second town center in the feudal age, providing one of the most unique dynamics in all of AoE 2. The 2TC boom is basically better than any other eco bonus, but it leaves the Cumans player incredibly vulnerable to pressure. Beyond that, feudal age siege workshops and battering rams can be an interesting niche play, and the cheaper stables and archery ranges are basically always useful. Once castle age rolls around, Cumans tend to go in one of two directions. Castle drop into Kipchaks into fast Imperial Age, or adding even more TCs and going for stable units such as Knights, Camels, and Step Plancers. Both plays have their strengths and weaknesses, but the most important thing is to get damage done because this Civ falls off a cliff in the late game. Kipchaks and post Imperial Age are generally underwhelming, and although you have Paladins and Decent Siege, the lack of Bracer and Gunpowder can be a real issue in many matchups. So last year I placed Cumans in the Major Changes Needed tier. Although the general identity of the Civ was there with the expansion and speed focused playstyle at the cost of tech tree and individual strength, the implementation of Cumans is one of the clunkiest in all of AoE 2. The second TC just, in my opinion, really limits your viable strategies, as doing basically anything else will put you behind economically. But even in going for the two TCs, it's such a game-breaking strategy that it forces your opponent to either kill you or get snowballed. Some people may enjoy that dynamic in individual games, but I think it's a poor idea to have an entire civilization revolve around it. As I've said before, I feel like humans are an excellent opportunity to add another unique building, something like a cheaper TC that trains villagers more slowly or something like that. Even going past the economy, Cumans have a terrible Imperial Age unique tech. Cuban mercenaries is basically never worthwhile, and it feels like one of those that needs to be completely scrapped. Kipchaks also feel like they could be stronger post-elite upgrade. Regardless, Cumans received no direct changes in 2024. Step Lancers are very good right now, and the Civ certainly benefits from that, but I still don't think it's enough to bump them up from the major changes needed tier. In my experience, Cumans tend to create some of the least fun games to both play and cast in all of AoE 2 right now. Like I said, the general general idea is there, but we really need to see some more refinement with their bonuses and tax. Moving right along, we next look at the favorite civilization of both Viper and Hera, the Dravidians. This infantry and naval civilization introduced with Dynasties of India would initially appear to share some similarities with existing ones like Vikings, Japanese, and Malay, and that is true to some degree, although there is plenty to talk about here. Largely a military-oriented civ, Dravidians nevertheless have some economic oomph to get them going. Getting an extra 200 wood upon reaching the next age is helpful in basically any strategy you can think of, and combines well with the cheap barracks upgrades and faster attacking skirmishers to enable a lot of early pressure. On water maps, the extra carry capacity on the fishing ships is an interesting bonus, as it tends to help more after the first deep fish or two, but can be very helpful on 
water maps from late Feudal Age until Deep Fish run out. Oh yeah, and that team bonus is one of the very best for water maps. It's just a helpful 25 wood savings in the Dark Age, which can matter a lot in team games. Nevertheless, despite all of this aggressive prowess, Dravidians have a couple of major weaknesses in the mid game. Most notably, the lack of anything close to a good stable, as well as pretty bad monks. This is what turns a lot of players off from the Dravidians, as you tend to need to focus on efficient armies of infantry and range units, preferably from some sort of forward position on the map. Speaking of compositions, Dravidians can play an archery range centric style perfectly fine throughout the entire game, with the option of elephant archers later on representing a ton of individual unit value. Infantry as well is easy to tech into with the cheap barracks upgrades, giving the Dravidians player a pretty straightforward path to a quick 200 population army of cheap units. On the water, this sieve has a complete naval tech tree on top of an excellent galley killer unique unit with the Therasadai, so no issues there. With that in mind, last year I somewhat controversially placed Dravidians in the almost there tier, with my only issue being that their castle age unique tech medical core didn't do enough. Beyond that, the sieve has noticeable strengths and weaknesses, and the cheaper wood cost on mangonels can at least somewhat mitigate their general weakness to that unit in the mid game. Sure, Dravidians are not a world beater sieve on Arabia, but their aggressive potential combined with efficient armies throughout the game make them far from hopeless. You just have to play a little bit differently with these guys. Even past Arabia, Dravidians are decent enough on closed maps, and as mentioned, are excellent on hybrid and water maps. I see a clear niche for this sieve. That said, I'm still not quite able to bump Dravidians up to the complete tier for 2024. The 33% cheaper siege was actually added in 2023, which I think has turned out quite well for the Civ, and even Medical Corps got a nice buff. Unfortunately, Dravidians have a little bit of an Arumi problem. The unit is so strong in melee combat that it's difficult to balance, but as of right now, the lack of Pierce Harbor makes them a very unattractive option in most situations, especially as their champ switch is so easy. But that's really it for right now. In my mind, Dravidians are an Arumi changer two away from being a complete civilization. Next up, we once again take a look at the African kingdoms with the Ethiopians. These guys are classified as an archer civilization by the game, and that is certainly what they're best known for. Faster attacking archers with thumb ring give you some very high damage units, but that's only part of their arsenal. Shotel warriors with torsion engine siege represent some of the most damage you can get from any civ in AoE 2, but of course all of those units are fragile and expensive. Above all else, Ethiopians are very much the glass cannon civ. Your only eco bonus comes in the form of an extra 100 food and 100 gold upon reaching the feudal age, which, although nice for early pressure, even a slick fast castle, pales in comparison to what many other civs have. Despite missing important text for cavalry, Ethiopians can still protect their archers in siege with free pikemen that can eventually become halberdiers, as well as camels that don't perform half bad against enemy cavalry. Naturally, this civ is going to be the best in more aggressive settings, and current pathing issues aside, they're still quite nice in that role. Flank and team games in particular are a strong point of this civ. Beyond that, Ethiopians are passable on both Arabia and Arena, and just serve as a fairly useful civ on most maps, providing you try and play to their strengths. Now, last year I did place Ethiopians in the something is off tier for a couple of reasons. First, the Shotel Warrior, although fun, didn't really see much play at high levels as it was just too expensive to use cost efficiently. On top of that, their team bonus of extra line of sight for towers and outposts was underwhelming at best. But you know what? The two direct changes to Ethiopians in 2023 addressed both of these issues. Royal Heirs, which used to be a boring tech that just made Shotels slightly better at what they were already good at, aka their quick train time, was altered to now reduce the damage dealt to that unit as well as camels by enemy cavalry. This is a pretty interesting bonus and helped mitigate some of the weaknesses to Shotels by heavy cavalry. Their camels as well went from being some of the worst due to missing bloodlines and plate barding armor to at least serviceable when fighting cavalry or cav archers. Furthermore, the Ethiopian team bonus was changed to outpost not costing stone. This is a really nice and in my opinion underutilized team bonus as it makes your entire team's outpost cost only as much as a house. For Ethiopians in particular, a civ that tends to utilize slow and expensive armies, being able to better see where enemies are attacking you from is really helpful. That said, even though Ethiopians have been addressed in every area I complained about, I still am not sure what to do with them on the tier list. We're gonna keep them in something is off for now. Even before the pathing issues of the last couple patches, Ethiopians were barely seeing any play in tournaments, and I would say are generally seen as a decent but not powerful sieve. I'm getting really tempted to make a power crep tier for this tier list, but I'll forego that for now. I honestly don't think Ethiopians need any changes, but they do feel like they are on the outside looking in on most maps. Now returning to the Age of Kings classics, we have the Franks. These guys are of course the prototypical knight civilization in AoE 2, and are going to be very recognizable to most of the fan base. This sieve is all about streamlined and straightforward gameplay, boasting a nice mix of economic, military, and defensive bonuses. Starting right off the bat, Franks get two early game eco bonuses with the faster working foragers and free farm upgrades. Scout play is certainly encouraged by this, but there is a lot of flexibility 
flexibility here, and Franks can actually go for basically any opening they want. Extra food from the forge bushes can go to men at arms just as easily as scouts, and horse collar is not something you can usually afford when opening archers. The extra HP for cavalry is an interesting bonus in the feudal age because it means your scouts have an extra 9 HP. That is obviously more than generic, but not exactly the 20 HP you get with bloodlines. So although Franks start off strong, they still want to get to castle age before too long. In mid game, you again possess a solid economy and get what is essentially free bloodlines for your knights. The cheaper castles can be used defensively to hang on against enemy pressure, or offensively to cement an existing lead. As the game goes late, paladins are certainly the selling point of the Franks, but barracks units, gunpowder, and throwing axemen can be used instead of, or in addition to, your heavy cavalry. Now despite what some forum users may think, Franks still have their fair share of weaknesses. Although solid throughout the game, this civ doesn't have the overwhelming aggressive potential of civs like the American civs or Magyars, nor do they have the economy and flexible tech tree of the Chinese, Malians, or Khmer. Franks are just a good, solid, middle-of-the-road civ that can work well on most land maps. For most players, the ease of their cavalry and castle drop play make them an attractive choice if you are learning the game or want a civ that can do the same thing in most matchups. At the higher levels, Franks are mostly seen as a pick on more open maps, as they still perform reasonably well against even the top-tier Arabia picks in the current meta. On top of that, Franks are still going to be one of the most powerful and reliable picks for a team game pocket civ on open maps, just because that heavy cavalry game plan is so streamlined. Franks have been in a solid spot for a while now, and last year I put them in the complete tier. They did not get any balance changes at all in 2022, and just felt like a strong but not overbearing choice on most land maps. Of course, people still complain about the Civ's high pick rate and win rate on the ladder, and the devs did make one change to the Franks in 2023. They nerfed their Castle Age castle discount to 15% instead of 25%. Although this seems to have the intended effect, and I still will place Franks in the complete tier for 2024, I just want to say that I really don't like this change. Of course, I would argue that Franks didn't need any changing at all, but if they were going to get nerfed, I would much rather see them lose their Forge Bush bonus. That is something that can be given to another Civ down the road, and 25% cheaper castles has existed since Age of Kings, whereas the Berry bonus was only given to them later because the Civ was actually underwhelming in Age of Conquerors. <sighs> oh well, I guess I can shout my opinions into the empty void of the internet. We go from one of the very oldest to one of the very newest Civs with our second to last entry of the day, the Georgians. This cavalry and defensive civilization was released back in October with the Mountain Royals DLC, and has certainly had an interesting arc in the metagame since then. We'll get more to that in a moment. Right off the bat, Georgians have a unique start compared to most civs, and that is how they begin with a mule cart drop-off site, but minus 50 food. This is a cool bonus because it can be applied in so many different ways, but it also makes the civilization rather tricky for casual players who can struggle to maintain constant villager production. Once Feudal Age comes in, your cavalry specialization starts to come online as those units regenerate HP, which is really useful for your scouts in their hit-and-run tactics. Still, the mid-game is where Georgians really start to shine. Their main eco bonus of fortified churches increasing the gather rate of nearby villagers by 10% can be difficult to optimize when booming. The building is an extra 200 wood after all, but placing them all over your economy just gives the Georgians player a huge boost to their productivity, as well as creating a powerful defensive matrix. Militarily, Georgians are all about their Monospa unique unit. They're cheap, fast, well armored, and have an enormous attack once you start grouping them together in large numbers. In fact, other than some supporting trash units, the Monospa is really all you need in most matchups. Strong castles that take less bonus damage are cheaper to repair and can boast extra attack make the Monospa production quite consistent, and it's not at all unusual to see the Georgians player just look to hang on in the early game until they can get their castles down and their Monospas humming. In fact, the Monospa was bugged at release to be even more powerful than it intended, which led to the entire Georgian Civ being banned in tournaments until the bug was patched out. As you can probably see, this is going to bring us to the problems with Georgians. This Civ is just so reliant on their borderline overpowered unique unit that you don't really get to see the rest of the Civ. For that reason, I will be placing them in the somewhat problematic tier. Georgian towers, infantry, monks, and heavy siege are all supposed to be notable aspects of the civilization that enable the more grindy defensive playstyle, but you never see it. Why do anything else when Monospa go burr? The defensive premise of the Civ makes a lot of sense, the reduced bonus damage taken when fighting from the high ground encourages more tactical play, and the efficient focus of your fortified churches in your economy and your reduced population cavalry work well together in creating a cohesive identity. The issue is, if you simply nerf the Monospa, then the Georgians become just another cavalry civ among like 10, and you won't have enough reason to play them. Obviously, these guys are still new, but we need to find a way to balance the Monospa with the rest of the tools the civilization has to offer. Lastly for today, we have our fifth Age of Kings civilization, the Goths. Although officially designated as an infantry civilization by the tech tree, I think the Goths would be more appropriately labeled as an infantry and infantry civilization, featuring more infantry per infantry. Including the unique tech, there are five distinct bonuses for that class of unit, as well as a deadly foot soldier unique unit to boot. But beyond merely focusing on infantry, Goths are 
all about spamming hordes of cheap, fast training, but somewhat weak units. The unit discount takes care of the cost side of things, and the team bonus and perfusion unique tech allows your units to fly out of the barracks. Archers are the natural counter to infantry, but hey, your anti-archer Huskarl can be trained out of the barracks as well, and with all of your infantry getting extra bonus damage versus buildings, you can just spam them to run over everything, especially with the extra pop space in the late game. More recently and at higher levels, Goths have become famous as an early game Civ, with the instantly researching Loom, extra damage versus Borers, and cheap militia giving the Civ a lot of potential to ruin their opponent's Dark Age. Ideally, this would allow them to survive the Feudal Age and early Castle Age where they're fairly weak, and then transition into their infantry spamming late game more safely. Getting something done early with Goths is quite important, as lacking a long-term eco bonus and having one of the worst defenses in the game can make surviving quite challenging. On top of all of that, Goths have one of the most limited tech trees in the game, meaning you will struggle to find good power units that aren't infantry, the one saving grace here being access to hand cannoneers and bombard cannons. So last year I placed Goths in the major changes needed tier. As iconic as the Civ is, it's just so frustrating to play against and with in so many situations. Certain archer civs like Mayans and Vietnamese can feel absolutely helpless against Goth spam, and Goths themselves can feel the same way against strong infantry civs like Japanese and Slavs. Beyond that, Goths basically had to lame in the Dark Age at higher levels, which, although interesting every now and again, it shouldn't be a necessity in most games for any civ to succeed. However, although the Goths only got one change in 2023, it was a big one. The civ now has more of a proper early game eco bonus with hunt lasting 20% longer. This gives some extra ammunition to the Goths early game and allows them to better get ahead in the Dark and Feudal Ages without relying so much on laming. Goths have honestly improved so much more as a standard civilization that I'm willing to put them all the way up in the almost there tier for 2024. We're getting to the point where we see pros pick Goths on aggressive maps not just for laming but because they are a good civ at applying early pressure. I still think that the extra bonus damage versus boars is really only useful when going forward so it could probably be removed and you still have the issue where many matchups can feel lopsided in the late game but with Goths having at least a better chance of not dying early on as well as the various buffs to swordsmen which are one of the better answers to Goths infantry spam for archer civs and I honestly don't think it's as big of a deal. The meta may change of course over 2024 but for now I'm reasonably happy with Goths for the first time in like forever. And with that we have completed our second of the 2024 civilization reviews. Based on my own work rate for these videos it seems like I should indeed be able to get a new part out every Monday. So be sure to tune in next week for the Gujars, Hindustanis, Huns, Incas, Italians, Japanese, Khmer, Koreans, and Lithuanians. And of course be sure to let me know what you think of the civilizations we discussed today in the comments. Lastly I do want to give a special shout out to my Patreon supporters with Anonymous and Gerard in the Great Wolf tier and then Carolyn, Dieter, Liquid Egg Product, Ryru, and Tanduri in the Dire Wolf tier. If you are interested in supporting my channel further and getting some extra perks the link to my Patreon is always in the description. But as always thank you all so much for watching and I'll see you guys next time.